thanks uh, for inviting me and uh, I will talk about commercial open source. So um, we get started here. Uh, a key thing to understand and it's still not widely really well understood is of course that open source by definition and license is not competitively differentiating. No? Everyone can have it, everyone can use it, any value created stays with those who use it and you can't really commercialize it, which is why saying there's open source business models by themselves is a misnomer because directly of open source you can't really make any money. Uh, the key insight to make our way to a concept now of commercial open source is to understand that there must be something else, a uh, close complement, I call it here, uh, that a company which commercializes open source uh, sells. So identifying what it is that you don't make available for free, developing it, nurturing it, and ultimately selling it, that is how a company in relation to some open source software can money, can make money. Uh, the idea here is ultimately that the open source available to everyone may create value for users, but then comes a company and tries to capture as much of that value, bring some to it, to the close complement, but possibly acquiring more of the total value, basically gaining customers. Um, this complement is of course the question what is that so here are a couple of examples um, tensorflow is a machine learning library uh, open source software developed by google made available for free fabulous software many people use it so google makes no money off that library but google has a service called tensor processing units running in their cloud which then makes tensorflow run much faster than if you would run it on your own hardware. So the close complement here in this first example is hardware for software, and then also the embedding in a cloud service. And this close complement, of course, is where Google wants users, the free loading users of the TensorFlow library, ultimately to go. Uh, so we already see a tension here in a sense that Google's actual desire is less that uh, to do good to the world by a good library, but really to get users into that cloud. And this idea of a closed complement really goes through all the different aspects of where you might find something uh, complementary. So if you look at some open source software like Drupal, a content management system, well, that's the company, Acquia Drupal with its branded Acquia Drupal distribution, so the close complement is how all the plugins get configured and then some plugins are even open source. So there's complementary software in this case uh, that is um, creating value, additional value, but then customers go from then users become customers and go from the free open source version to a closed source version. That's how a company uh, captures uh, most of that value. Perhaps the most common version these days is operating a piece of open source software in the cloud uh, for customers. So Gradle is a build system uh, that's freely available, widely used, um, say Java development. And the complement, the close complement is running Gradle at scale in the cloud. So you don't have to wait for your software to build for half a day, you get it in five minutes. That's a great value proposition. Uh, but it's not freely available because uh, it runs in the cloud. Consulting is another option. So PostgreSQL is a fabulous community open source software, but uh, the complement knowledge, how to deploy it, how to configure it, how to operate it, that's of course labor by people in a consulting business. Similarly, supporting uh, existing software like the GCC, uh, there um, small scale um, uh, consultancies to do that. So the key insight is, yes, there may be some piece of open source software of different shades, and then find what's complementary that you're not giving away for free and possibly even nurturing and building for the purpose of not giving it away for free. That uh, makes sense. So the co close complement is the core idea. 
If you go beyond that, you have to recognize, though, that there are coarse grain business models that put things to give, put different uh, diverse factors together in a different way. And in my opinion, there are these three core patterns of business model, uh, which I call service and support firms, single vendor open source firms, and open source distributors. The first one is uh, service and support firms. It's basically human labor somehow. So the business model scales by hiring more people, hiring higher skilled people, etc. What you do is you service an open source software for customers who want that service, like help with configuring it, help with running it, maybe building applications on top of it. Here, an important distinction uh, is necessary to make between community open source and commercial open source. So I'm talking about businesses right now who earn a living, but in a second, we will really talk about commercial open source software and what that is. Service and support firms, companies who only provide services, human labor for open source software, usually only do that for community open source software, which is open source software uh, that is widely shared in its ownership and its copyright. So many different people contributed. There's actually a diverse community of contributors so that no single commercial entity can control it. Um, so example with Clever Solutions, the GCC, the GNU compiler uh, figures in because nobody owns the GCC. Uh, it's a wide set of people who share in its uh, copyright. Service and support firms, if you take the pure economic perspective, are relevant, but the actual value of the company is not that high. Um, it's really hard to build barriers to entry to that market if it's community open source. Uh, they will not receive venture capital funding because the return on investment is comparatively low. It's consultancies. We have many more consultancies than product companies. The next two business models are true product businesses. So project or consultancies, product business. And, the and so the first is what I call center open source firms. And uh, these are companies that develop an open source software, could be an application, could be an infrastructure component for commercial exploitation. And they do everything they can to be the only company who actually services or makes it, turns the software into a product. And so there is high barriers of entry to providing services around that open source component. How to do that is, uh, uh, is a deeper discussion. I'll get to some of the second, but the key really is, and the examples would be MySQL or MongoDB these days. The key really is that this single vendor is and wants to stay the only sole single vendor who can actually make money of that open source software, even though that piece of software is available as open source. They make money off by the way of compliments, but they also make sure through various means that competition uh, stays away. It's a constant struggle of how they do that, but um, uh, here's some idea. But let me take a step back. I already introduced community open source as software that is owned and developed by a community of diverse participants. So the first key thing to understand about single vendor open source is, as I said, there's a sole vendor who develops it and the way they will actually not accept outside contributions. So no community contributions unless the rights usually get signed over to the company so that the company as a single entity remains the only sole uh, owner of the software, which gives them a fair uh, amount of flexibility in keeping competitors away and making sure they are the only provider. Um, that is a shortcoming in some people's opinion in the definition of open source, which is purely legal uh, based on at least what the open source initiative website says. It defines open source software as an artifact. Uh, the license of which has to fulfill certain criteria. And people often, the open source enthusiasts will say that this is not enough, but rather true 
true open source is only community open source, meaning there's not only that diverse number of stakeholders, but really um, an open collaborative process that allows everyone to participate, which is exactly what the single vendor open source firms are preventing. So open source traditionally is just by license. You can add an open process to it, but then commercial open source is out of the question. It's not open source in that respect any longer, which is why we have a fair bit of struggle in the industry as to how to define open source. Commercial or single vendor open source uh, companies have another struggle, which is, again, how do you prevent uh, you, to see your margins eroded from your products by anyone who comes in, takes your open source software and builds a product on top of it? Uh, after all, it's open source. So I hear uh, today and elsewhere how open source fundamentally is a public good, and that's true, but all these single vendor open source firms try to make it open source with strings attached. Questionable whether it's in the spirit than open source. The whole point is they still try to restrict how other people can use the software using hard measures, trademarks, using soft measures, processes that are not open and forth. From my perspective, sometimes it ruffles feathers, that's business. So uh, I don't value, don't make a value judgment on that. The current struggle, if you followed it, because that would be a natural question to ask here, is um, what about these funny licensing things going on? So we saw a lot of companies in a more mature stage who are the single vendor open source firms like Redis Labs and MongoDB change the licenses. And the new license is a so-called source available license, which is not even open source any longer. And it's actually very nice because these source available licenses say, it's like open source. We give you all the benefits of open source, unless you want to compete with us and then you're not allowed to use the software, which is like spot on on what the goal of single vendor open source firms is, which is again, to prevent competition uh, from, from uh, their own work. So why would you even open source if actually you have to do the development all yourself or yourself? So I have a whole uh, 15 <laughs> lecture class on the benefits of uh, commercial open source strategies. It is most, it's a lot of things, some innovation you might get. I think the strongest, strongest argument is usual, usually in the so-called frictionless distribution. You don't have to go through complex sales cycles to get the foot in the door of potential customer companies. You really get a uh, 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 great start to sell your product if it's already in use in the free world with customers. And so there are business processes of sales behind that. That's a bit too much for, for this short talk here. Single vendor open source uh, is what is and let me actually show that to you perhaps here. Can I do that? Yes, nicely. So single vendor open source is the dominant uh, enterprise software business model uh, in many spaces. Silicon Valley, I would argue, uh, 15 years ago, they said um, taking that disruptive strategy of open sourcing first to in unseat incumbents. Here's a, here's a kind of market research I track on the side. You can see there are two different waves, really. Sorry, Dirk, to, uh, to interrupt. Uh, very sorry. I don't think we can see your presentation because I realized I think you're trying to show one uh, from what you're saying, but we do not see it. Oh, you, there's no screen sharing working. Why do yes. I not? Okay. Um, that took you 15 minutes to tell me. Okay. That is fine. I... <laughs> well, here we go. Um, is that, I can't screen share. Okay, now no, I can. No, no, it's coming now. Oh. All right, that is a bummer. Sorry, everyone. It looks like I was too energized to get going. That is silly. Anyway, so um, what shall I say now? Mm, okay, so I talked about these two models, uh, service providers, which is really just labor and from say a market capitalization, not so important because, well, um, they are not even in the market, they're not companies. Then I talk about single vendor open source firms, which are companies that are 
providing an enterprise software, uh, usually under an open source license, and then they have the close complements that they sell. Usually it's the cloud service. And finally, I'm talking, given that I have maybe a minute left, about um, open source uh, distributors. In my opinion, a third model that should not be mixed in with single vendor open source firms. So the distributor firms are Red Hat, SUSE, Canonical. And the key here to understand is that they don't necessarily own the open source components, but they create a product from combining a large set of otherwise possibly disparate components into one. They own the IP of what's in between components. They're, in my opinion, as possibly rapidly commercial as anyone else. And the IP, though, that they built the business on is not the open source software itself, but rather, again, what's in between. So the IP is expressed as configuration databases, the test suites, how they set up the build processes, and so forth. Now, the distributor firms are worth mentioning in addition to the single vendor open source firms because they are yet one level up. So service and support firms, uh, you can live off it single vendor open source firms now you're in venture cap silicon valley venture capital land and you can become a unicorn and can get very rich but it's still just regular enterprise software um, but open source distributors are a level up as you can see with the variation of red hat before it was basically acquired by ibm they do not only do single applications or components they do whole layers of the stack so that's why they are much more expensive, much higher valued in the market, and also much less common because there are not that many layers of the stack as their enterprise applications. So here are some examples. Um, Linux is the obvious one. That's an operating system. Uh, Kubernetes is basically the cloud operating system, if you will. So these are large, complex aggregates of software that are becoming commercial, are commercial distributions. And they are much more valuable than any single single vendor open source. But the IP, again, the skills you need to have to build such a business are quite different from, uh, from the single vendor open source firms. So I think that's it from my side. I specialize in commercial open source. I'm regularly in the Silicon Valley, do my research there. And if you have any questions, I'm here for you. Great, fantastic. So for now, uh, Joshua will come in to uh, speak about open source uh, and uh, making open source default in academia. And then we'll have the um, opportunity to answer, answer some questions uh, for all three after. So let's see if Joshua comes online now. So make sure that he can share his presentation too. And here, Joshua. Okay. Yeah, give me one second. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. You can. Right. We can see you in a second too. <laughs> you can hear me and see me. Uh, we don't see your face yet, but I think your presentation is coming up now. Uh, give me one more second. Goodness. It always takes a second oh, to press the button. Um, there we go. We still don't see your face, but maybe it's fine. And oh, right. now it's coming. Okay. I'm yeah, wrong. Thanks. Now you will see you. Perfect. Take it away. All right, everyone. Um, so what I would like to talk about is a little bit falling off of the, the last group of presentations about things that academic academia could do to make open source uh, the default. And that goes for open source software and open source hardware. So I want to start off with just the good news. Our team is winning. If we look at how software is being developed, free and open source software is becoming the default in, within industry. Many of the top you know, Fortune 500 companies already use it. Open educational resources are everywhere, being integrated into more and more classes, if not being completely run off of them. Open access within academia is also becoming the default, uh, particularly in North America, are instead of purchasing kind of open access rights with publishers of what what we're doing in North America is we're setting up our own repository. So almost every university has their own version of open source scholarship and more and more of the funders are encouraging or demanding that researchers start to use it. And then last but not least is open source hardware. 
Uh, a few years ago, it was basically unheard of, but today there's dedicated journals to it. There's an explosion of resources. Um, I try to keep track of all, or I used to try to keep track of all the open source hardware within academia. And at this point, it's simply not possible. So what I want to talk about today is how we can make it the default so that rather than open source being sort of the, the afterthought that's sort of tagged on to projects, it becomes the way that we do everything. Uh, so there is a lot of momentum in our favor. Anybody that's very serious about computing already knows this. Uh, supercomputers, every single one of them on the planet at this point is running Linux. At the same time, it's starting to take over applications that we all have in our back pockets, our smartphones, as uh, open source software begins to dominate in that sphere as well. And if we track this out into the future, we've never had good inroads into the, the desktop market, uh, but mobile and tablets are certainly doing well. And the Internet of Things is also already dominated by, by open source. And, you know, we heard from the last presenter talking a little bit about how to commercialize open source. And so uh, on the hardware side, Tesla did a, a very interesting example where they purposely open sourced their hardware for the purpose of becoming a platform. So if I want to start up any kind of company associated with electric cars right now, I, it's very likely that I'm going to use one of the open source platforms and Tesla got there first. And this absolutely can lead to money. As we saw with, you know, I don't know if Elon Musk is still the richest person in the world, but he's very wealthy no matter how you look at it. Within academia, we're starting to take open source quite seriously as well. So this is a, a log plot of the looking up the terms open source software and open source hardware on Google Scholar. And as you can see, the 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 top line is for software, and it has had exponential growth and is now, I don't want to say it's saturated, but you know, if there's tens of thousands of articles that come out on open source software, or use open source software every year. Um, you know, most of the people that are are into it, like writing about code are are publishing open source software. Um, the interesting fact is that open source hardware is roughly 15 years behind and on that same exponential growth curve. And so you know, in the olden days, the thought was you couldn't even have open hardware because, you know, you had to actually physically build things. But now with distributed manufacturing technologies, um, software and hardware are really becoming synonymous with each other. And so how open source software or open source hardware is kind of playing out in academia is through distributed manufacturing. So you have one scientist design something for herself. And rather than just manufacture it and use it in her own lab, if she shares it with the rest of the community, with an open source license so that anybody that makes a derivative from it is obligated to reshare it with the community, then we get more and more complex things. So this kind of cartoon that I did in this somewhat now dated book is actually happened in real life. And so it started off with a simple little tube. And now there are dozens of types of centrifuges built around that tube. So if the original person that put the tube up or any of the original test tubes needs a centrifuge, it's freely available. Uh, the, the one in the upper left is the Dremel Fuge. This was one of my favorites. It's just a chuck that you attach to a Dremel drill that costs you know maybe 50 or 60 bucks. And now you can build yourself an ultra centrifuge on the cheap in the middle of nowhere. Uh, some of the ones on the right are, you know, could be integrated into any lab. And the one in the middle shows how far we can go with distributed uh, technologies for fabricating things. This centrifuge is 100% 3D printed and you can get the quality control with open source software that you can run on your cell phone. So if you have a cell phone and a 3D printer in the middle of nowhere, uh, as long as you have access to electricity, you can manufacture yourself a lab grade uh, centrifuge and ensure that, you know, when you're spilling down your blood samples or whatever you're doing, that you uh, hit the, the right forces. Um, open source hardware has infiltrated many of the types of labs. Um, my lab uses, primarily did solar photovoltaic research, so we needed a lot of optics equipment. And a lot of the mechanical pieces for optics equipment uh, get very pricey. Uh, you know, it starts off for usually around $50, and you need dozens of them to make an actual optics setup. Uh, optical rail runs $380 a meter, but you can get open beam for $12 a meter, and then you could 3D print all your fixtures for pennies rather than, say, buy them for $25 to $50. The overall sort of take-home message is that if you use this completely parametric open source optics library, you'll save between 97 and 99% on any kind of optics setup that you're, you're putting together. You can also use the distributed manufacturing tools like 3D printers as scientific automation tools themselves. And so here's an example of using an upside down Delta 3D printer uh, for both mixing of chemicals and for uh, fluid distribution. So this is like a 96 well plate that you'd normally have to pay a lot, like tens of thousands of dollars to have that automated. And now that's, it's just a couple thousand. And so when we're seeing these large amounts of savings, particularly in open hardware for scientists, um, where you use distributed manufacturing, generally you save between 90 and 
off of commercial proprietary tools. Um, when I did a, a Fulbright Alltel University Distinguished Chair, one of the, the tasks I was set with was looking at all of Finland to say, you know, should we strategically start to invest in open hardware development for tools that we're buying all the time or tools that we're importing from other countries or outside of Europe? But, you know, would it make any sense? What kind of money would we make? And so the kind of an exhausted study of what purchases Finnish researchers were making and which ones would make the most sense to, to open source, we found that if they were, uh, you know, even if they just did the bare minimum, they'd save almost 3 million euros a year. And if they got aggressive about it, it'd, it'd be closer to over like 28 million uh, euros. Uh, recently, I, you know, the, there was some thinking that a lot of the easy open source stuff, like the, the pipe head racks and stuff like that had already been done and were the technologies that we're developing now, uh, still seeing the same amount of savings. So last year I did, uh, a review of all of the open hardware for science and found that the savings were 94% for free and open source tools in general over a commercial equivalence. And if you used a substantial amount of 3d printing and, uh, open source electronics like an Arduino, uh, the, the savings could be even higher. And so we're getting, what we're finding is that the tools are becoming more and more sophisticated. And as they're becoming more sophisticated, they're going after the, the higher price point items. And from a national perspective, those are the ones that you would make the most sense to go after from uh, funding. So you want to fund open hardware development rather than fund people just to purchase things. So to, to give an example of, of how powerful this can be, uh, consider the, the open source syringe pump library that, that we developed. And so this would, again, was done in OpenSCAD. And so you can put any motor and any syringe combination together that you'd like in order to get the performance that you're looking for for your particular application. And we ran it off of a Raspberry Pi, so you can also do this uh, you know, off of Wi-Fi off the web. And more and more sophisticated versions like the, the one that uh, uh, Billy Clark did with uh, force feedback so you can start to use this not just for kind of base medical applications or electrospinning and chemistry but also to do some real material science with it and so be because we developed this in my lab i have all the economic numbers for it and so it took about thirty thousand us and with a 52 percent overhead to develop the, this open source syringe pump library it replaces syringe pumps on the absolute lowest end at 150 dollars the double pump like the one i'm showing here is it costs over 200 uh, $2,400 commercially. In the first month, it was downloaded a thousand times. So the downloaded substitution value on the very low end after only a month was $168,000, which is far more than we invested in putting it for the overall scientific community. And if we go on the high end, uh, over two and a half million dollars. Since that time, this, this, this particular design has been downloaded more than 10,000 times. And so I can conservatively say we've saved the scientific community $20 million. Now, if you are a funder of science, this is absolutely one of the highest return on investments you're going to get. And the numbers get silly. You're going to be well over a thousand percent return on investment. If your goal is to push science forward as fast as possible, you want to make low cost open source tools that other people can replicate and start to kind of, you know, stand on the shoulders of, of giants, take the, the thing that they just read about in the, the latest journal and start to be able to do it themselves. So to give you a feel for how this actually, what this actually looks like, I have this cartoon. And so this is using uh, U.S. numbers as an example. So in the U.S., the two biggest funders are the National Science Foundation and the NIH, both of whom have uh, kind of success rates under 10%. The last time I looked at the NSF one, it was like 7%. So if you submit a grant, your chances of winning it are only 7%. So let's say you're a science funder, a big one, and you're putting a million dollars into to some sort of technology and you have two choices of the way to go. You can use the standard model where you would pay, say $100,000 a year for 10 years to buy scientists equipment, or you could use the open source model. So in the first year, the, the both models look about the same. Only one scientist out of 10 is funded. And that scientist has to be a pretty, uh, you know, a, an older gentleman usually that has substantial experience in the field, has built up a, a, a large number of papers in order to have an H index high enough that you're even gonna consider funding them. And so you, you make one person happy but everybody else loses. Where open source really starts to shine is in year two through 10. And so if the, the first year, the open source uh, person that won the, the contract did a good job and made the, the open source hardware available to everyone, the second year, because we know at the very most, it's gonna be 10% for the cost to actually you know, buy the materials to build the hardware, you could fund everybody that applies for the grant. And so no matter what we're talking about, no matter how sophisticated the tool, after you funded the open hardware development of it, you could start to provide it to all of your um, grant, everybody that's applying for a grant. Whereas in the proprietary model, every year uh, you're only funding one person. And so 
in the open hardware model, because you you could fund them and maybe fund them to improve upon the design, that's what the little stars represent, that you're getting better and better equipment over time. And so if we add this all up, in the proprietary model, after 10 years, you've only funded 10 scientists, and most of them are have now outdated, unuseful equipment. If you think about how fast science is moving now, to have a tool that's you know eight years old is probably unacceptable. 90% of your scientists remain unfunded, where in the open hardware model, you get a huge return on investment, over 809,000%. 91% of your scientists uh, have equipment that you funded them for, and all of those research tools are easily upgradable um, only for the cost of materials. And so they're uh, much more likely to be uh, the latest and greatest, the state of the art. And so if we, we start thinking about how can we encourage open source, both on the software and the hardware side within academia. And so an idea I had was to start thinking about making open source endowed chairs. And so the, the typical terms for an endowed chair is you just have to demonstrate excellence in your field, you become a really big fancy person, and they give you an endowed, endowed chair. But an open source endowed chair would have two more requirements. That requirement would be that everything that you do must be made open access. So all of your writing, you write a paper, you make an open access version uh, available, or you publish it in an open access journal. And the second one is that you release all your intellectual contributions into the public domain or under open source licenses. And for some academics, that might sound extreme, but the, the kind of the beauty of this is that you're getting the endowed share. So it comes with a lot of prestige, and it also may come with something interesting. So I ran two surveys, one in Canada and one in the US, with this idea of open source endowed shares and, and sent um, uh, electronic surveys to, to many of my colleagues. And so the result, results are in. So within Canadian faculty, 81% of the people that responded were willing to accept an open source endowed professorship. 34%, uh, more, th more than a third of Canadian faculty members would take the endowed chair with nothing else. They would be willing to publish all their work open access and put all of their technical work in the public domain or with open source licenses without giving them a single penny. Uh, the majority of them, though, one of the normal things that come with an endowed chair. And so they would want uh, about a third wanted graduate assistance to be paid for, and about half wanted a discretionary budget. And so the, the results that we can get from this, uh, this kind of little mini study is that there's a huge widespread sentiment in favor of knowledge sharing within academia within Canada, and that an open endowed professorship might be one effective way to catalyze and increase sharing in this community that's kind of already prepped for it. And you might be thinking to yourself, sure, this is Canada. They're known for being nice people. Um, maybe, you know, they're already sort of already pre-primed for open source. Well, what about, you know, the, the Americans, which maybe don't have the, the same kind of national characteristic of what they're known for. But uh, interestingly enough, the numbers come out even slightly better in the American case. So there's a super majority of almost 87% would be willing to accept an open source endowed professorship and only 13 percent were unwilling under any circumstances and so you have 13 percent of these hardcore people that maybe think that they're going to become rich by uh, getting patents and, and selling their their technology to a vc this generally doesn't happen of all the people that i interviewed and everyone that i've ever talked to i don't know a single professor that funds his or her own research with money that comes from the patents that they've uh, developed at a university not a single one you might know one or two i if, if you are please send them my way I, i'm very interested to talk to them to see how they did it in general um that is simply not a, an economic way uh, to make money as a professor um what the results of this u.s study show is that there's a willing even in american academia to expand open access to science they want to have science progress at a faster rate. That's kind of use it falling along the, the open source developmental platform. And from a funder's perspective, there is a large opportunity to move towards open science by funding open source endowed chairs. Something that we, we just uh, have started at Western uh, University in the engineering department is to start to also fund students to develop open source hardware projects. And so the, the idea behind this fund is that if an engineering student has a good idea and they they would like to take it to the next step, but you know often you know engineers or often students of all kinds um, don't have a lot of excess capital. They're spending a lot on tuition. They, they don't really have necessary time to work with their studies. And so what this does is provide a small amount of money that gets them started so that they can make a prototype and to see if the idea has any legs. And so this just started, so I don't have any data yet on whether or not this is going to be successful, but the, you know, of the students that I've shared it with so far, they are certainly energetic and enthusiastic about it. And so to, to summarize, the opportunities to maximize the return on investment for research funding is 
you know, obviously all publicly funded science should be open access. There should be open access mandates, and that can happen at the national and even at the university level. And we're starting to see more and more funders start to move in this direction that now I think this is becoming the default. And so we've kind of won on the open access front. A lot of uh, faculty members still aren't actively um, sharing their open access articles, even when they're required to. You can see this kind of in the, the shaming that Google Scholar does um, on your personal profile. The, and, and the other uh, kind of obvious thing to do, the next step, would be if we're funding science with our tax dollars, not only should we be able to read the science, but we should be able to use it. And that means that all software that's developed using public funds should be freely available to everyone, and that all hardware developed should be freely available to everyone. I think something that, that not everybody appreciates is that, especially for patents, there is no clause that allows you to use it unless you've paid for it. So if I patent something, you can't use it. You can't do science on it. You can't do research on it. You have to get a license for me even to make it. And so the that kind of flies in the face of, you know, we're, we're dumping millions of dollars into trying to, to move science forward. And yet we're allowing individual researchers to, to patent or the, their universities to patent the ideas and not allow anyone else to get to it. And so this is at both the national and the funder level. Um, lastly is... Uh, strategic investment. And so we should start to invest uh, public research funds for science into developing open source technologies, whether software or hardware, that are in the best interest of the nation. We should start to fund open source development. This can be at the, the, the university, the funders and the national level. And then finally, we should th think about funding open source endowed chairs. And so I'll leave you with this. Everything that my group does is at apropedia.org slash fast. Uh, we're the free appropriate sustainable technology research group. Uh, if you're interested in anything that I've ever done, uh, you can get it there. And so I've essentially done what I what I'm talking about is get a funded endowed chair to do open source research. Um, speaking of which, if any of you are a little younger and looking for a fully funded PhD to do open source development, particularly on the technology side, uh, please drop me an email. I would be happy to talk to you. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I have to echo uh, Jan, <laughs> who wrote Mind Blowing. I can only agree. Um, well, let's um, uh, let's invite Veronique uh, next up uh, for her presentation um, on IT organizations. Let's see, Veronique. Perfect. There you are. Um, if you have a presentation, you can also share it now. Um, we should make you. Presenter, yes. Perfect. And you're still muted in case. Um, I think, yeah, presentation has come up. We can see you. So I think we can get going. So, hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share with you the work we have done with uh, Professor Chauvet and Goudarzy um, on how the um, communities uh, um, are linked with uh, formal structures. And so we are interested in um, commercial open source as DIRC, but in this, um, uh, in this article we really uh, concentrate on the links with uh, communities. Why? Uh, oh. Okay. Why is the... Uh, hang on, I have to check. Why is, why is that? Why is it going to the second? Mm. Okay. Okay, this, this is fine. <clears throat> so why is this subject important? Um, first, we define knowing communities as networks that interact and exchange knowledge in order to foster creation and innovation. And we know that communities play a critical role in the innovation of organizations. And this is particularly true in software industry. Um, the critical role of these uh, communities in the software industry is all the more important as all industries are going digital. 
and therefore all companies are linked in one way or another to one or more open source communities. Um, as Dirk has said, uh, interactions between organizations and communities are sometimes difficult. And he spoke about MongoDB and uh, the recent cases of Elasticsearch and MongoDB show that these relations are sometimes very difficult. Um, I would say that uh, use is a common factor for the um, whole software industry. And uh, if there was no use of open source, there would be no implication in communities. But use comes often without getting involved at all in uh, these communities. And I would say that implication grows along with experience. This sharing innovation with communities has always already uh, been theorized, uh, theorized, but uh, it was either studied from community point of view or when it was studied from FERP's point of view, it was with qualitative studies, uh, studying often big companies, and mainly uh, studying the interactions with only one community. And here, our purpose is to study what it means to be involved with internal uh, knowing communities, when there are many knowing communities, and how does the use of open source affect this involvement? And software industry for us is an emblematic case of this question. Uh, so we use the mixed research design, first quantitative study, then qualitative, and then again quantitative. For the quantitative uh, study, our objective was to validate the scales and to test the effect of use on open source on community involvement. Then we tried to explicit our model results, and then we came back to our quantitative data to explore the central role of formalization in community involvement. I will focus a little bit on our data. Uh, for the quantitative studies, we uh, used the National Survey on Open Source on 2017 that was uh, done in France with all uh, professional organizations for uh, IT and uh, open source um, software. The, they sent themselves a survey uh, to all their um, uh, members, and uh, we um, did then the analysis together. The respondents are either organizations using and uh, as organizations editing or integrating open source software. We had 345 uh, answers, but we eliminated uh, a few of them. And um, we kept 307 managers using open source, and um, among which 126 are providing open source offers. As you can see, Half of the, um, the respondents are from the market side, and half of them are more from the technical side. Um, we used AIR for the scales development, um, and then we did some structural mo uh, modeling um, using two approaches in order to make sure our um, results were um, effective. For the case studies analysis, we chose three organizations, three French organizations who are heavily involved in open source uh, ecosystems. We participated to numer numerous meetings with them and we uh, conducted semi-structured interviews and we did some content analysis um, using um, open source tools and we coded according to the scale dimensions that I will talk to you a few minutes later. Now I, I want to um, uh, speak to you about the contributions to research that we make. Um, there are three of them. The first of them is the creation of scales for open source use and for involvement in open source communities. 
use of open source has already uh, been uh, described um, um, a, a lot, but this has this been described in several facets and uh, um, usually making a distinction between final user for everyday software and or open source used or incorporated in product. And our uh, study reveals that the use of open source is more than that. In fact, it is the organizational use of open source methods, tools, and components. Um, for the community involvement, we um, find a um, we find a, a description of three uh, uh, categories of involvement. The formalized involvement um, concerns organizations that adapt their um, employees' work contracts, that set up rules to organize contributions, and that set up a formalized process to, for recognizing contributors. The result oriented is the second one, and it concerns organizations that are searching for key people in the open source communities to recruit them or to influence uh, development decisions. And third, the interconnected organizations are um, uh, concerns um, organizations that are members of one or more um, open source uh, consortia and that have close relationships with them and that actively contribute to the projects. I wanted to uh, make a little poll with you, but I think I don't have the opportunities to do it. Uh, I don't have the... You, you, if you want, you can uh, do it with the plus symbol in the bottom left corner. Okay. But um, if it's a bit complicated, we can we can no, also it's... just use it in the in the uh, discussion section. I wanted, and you can ask I wanted to ask you whether you think uh, whether you think um, the link between um, organizations and uh, hang on oriented. Interconnected. I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what is the most frequent, uh, the most frequent way of uh, involving in communities? All right. That's uh, people can vote for. I guess for a little bit now, but I guess you can. Continue up yes. with the vote, and then uh, you can. Okay. So this this is the um, the the point of my second contribution. I can see from the uh, the results that you that have appeared already that, for instance, result oriented and interconnected are uh, main. Um, um, main ways of involving um, according to you and our research shows that in fact the, the main um, um, category the main involvement well in, in fact uh, we show that uh, use always um, um, always in um, Always comes with uh, always comes with community involvement, and community involvement comes with experience. But uh, what we see, and what really surprised us, is that the formalized involvement is the most important, because um, of uh, all literature that we read before. Um, we, we know that um, a lot of organizations are supposed to be uh, very opportunistic. So we would have thought result oriented would be more prevalent. And also we know that in the different categorizations that exist, the interconnected way is um, considered as the, the, the most achieved uh, way of involvement. So we would have thought that perhaps interconnected uh, way of involving would have been more important. 
but rather than that, we had the formalized in, um, way of involving. And therefore, we, we, we went to our case studies to um, understand why uh, interconnected involvement is so um, it's not so important. Um, and we then studied the specific role of formalization. Uh, first, uh, um, our case studies, they revealed us that anyway, for any uh, IT organization, there is a need to use code and to rely on communities and to rely on many communities. And there is a ratio to, of one to 10 between what you take from the communities and what you produce yourself. Second, we... Um, from, from this, from this uh, uh, organizations that were deeply involved in uh, communities, we could see that, okay, they use a lot and sometimes they help, um, but only when it uh, brings value to the communities. And when they help, they do it well. Third, they all, all of them um, told us that there is a great need for tools uh, in order to be um, uh, involved in communities, which whatever uh, it could be, governance rules or guide, git versions, tracking tools, and so on. So the um, formalization seemed to have a specific role. Um, formalization in their experience is different from bureaucracy. For um, organization in the traditional industry, I would say formalization often means bureaucracy, but here it is a different sense for formalization. And therefore, we came back to our data and we studied the role of formalized involvement as a mediator between um, the two other uh, involvements. And we could see that uh, in this case, uh, the, the two um, other community involvement, uh, the two uh, direct links become, become non-significant and um, formalized really acts as a strong mediator with result-oriented involvement, but even more with interconnected involvement. And this is uh, more um, uh, um, okay or in concordance was with what our case studies state. As a conclusion, I can say that here we bring two scales, one for the use of open source and one for community involvement. We um, assess the link between use and involvement and we uh, really um, uh, try to understand what is what could be a symbiosis or interconnected involvement and what the specific role of formalization is. For um, we bring managerial contributions uh, and give customer arguments to um, um, to organizations. First, we explain them that using open source is much more than using uh, everyday tools and that involvement comes with experience. And then at last, what we would study uh, in the few years to come, um, study in more details the specific role of formalization as a mediator, then um, try to assess the performance of the three facets of involvement. And then we would like also to generalize these uh, um, scales and these links to other industries for instance, robotics or um, mobility uh, uh, sectors, where lots of things happen um, in um, open source hardware, as uh, Joshua said. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Veronique. Uh, that's very nice. Um, then I would invite Dirk and Joshua back to the stage. Um, so we can maybe answer a question or two that has, have been asked before. And the results are in. Oh, yeah, results are in. It's interesting. Yeah, okay, interesting. <laughs> Let's just see if Dirk uh, can also join us. 
maybe it's still uh, striking with the camera. Maybe let's start with one question. Sorry. Well, how do I join? I'm sorry, Sivan, how do I join? Ah, uh, you click the clam camera symbol. Uh, symbol. It's only the camera, camera. okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can also actually share my face again. Um, let's maybe start one question uh, for Piers, because one you have already answered in the chat is very nice. Um, but there was another one, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, by Carla on um, EU pursuing responsible innovation. Um, how do you see open source aligning with responsible innovation? Sorry. That's a, that's a, both of Carla's questions are really good. The, the other one's much easier to answer. So uh, the, the open source work that I do would all be fall under the appropriate technology umbrella. And appropriate technology was that kind of 1970s idea that, you know, we would only do technologies that were in the best interest of the people that were using them. And it was super, super popular in the 70s and then in the 80s, it kind of died. And, you know, back then the idea was, if, you know, say you needed a water pump in a developing country village, you would send away to a nonprofit in Britain with a self-addressed stamped envelope and they'd put the plans in, in the envelope for you and send it back. Well, now with the internet basically being everywhere, and distributed technology finally being good enough that you can actually make real things with it. I think the kind of the golden age of open source appropriate technology or OSAT is finally here. And so we're seeing, you know, a lot of the tools that we develop in my lab and people are developing kind of in, um, you know, wealthy countries can be immediately applied um, in, in countries that aren't so wealthy or by individuals that aren't so wealthy. And so I think a lot of the more appropriate or responsible technologies, particularly the environmental ones are kind of, open for business. And then to answer your other question in, in a little bit more detail, um, why would a business want to fund open source development? And Dirk touched on some of these where you would have an open source business, but a lot of the businesses I work with aren't necessarily open source to begin with, uh, but they fund my lab to create open source hardware usually. And that the reason is I think of it as a secondary supplier model. You want to find open source things that you can make that make them more money if they're shared more widely. So you actually want as many people copying as possible. And to give you a couple of examples, one is a enzyme company, which has nothing at all to do with my research, but we had made an open source calorimeter for, for our stuff and they saw it and they were selling a, a calorimeter for a couple hundred dollars to use their enzymes to tell if there was nitrate in water or soil or um, uh, forage for, for animals. And that what they were interested in is going after a new market because their several hundred dollar um, calorimeter was sort of outside the price point of something that you'd see in grade school or high school. They're wondering if we could make an open source one. And so we collaborated, they funded us. We got, ended up getting some federal funding and funding from the, the company to make an open source nitrate tester. Ours cost $50 and you can build it yourself. It was so good that it was better than the one that the company was, was selling. And so they started to manufacture them ourselves using distributed you know, 3D printing. Uh, so they, you can buy one from the company directly and you can make one yourself for, for substantially less. Uh, but the beauty is they don't care if you buy the perimeters because that's not what they're selling. They're selling enzymes. And the more perimeters that are out there that need their enzymes in order to run the nitrate test, and it's, you know, it's completely environmentally safe and it helps you kind of do citizen science based uh, you know, testing in the, the environment that everybody wins. And so they funded open hardware development on one of their sub secondary uh, products in order to sell more of their primary product. And then with you know solar photovoltaic vendors, I do this all the time. Anything that I do that increases market for them, they're all about. And that goes from the material suppliers that are you know selling the back sheets to photovoltaic manufacturers to the photovoltaic manufacturers themselves. If I can open source something downstream that makes it you know easier for them to sell more modules, they're all over that. And so. I think the, the trick for either academics like me that are trying to you know keep students funded or for um, businesses is to find those places where you want to have more copying of your design in order to create more wealth uh, for everybody, um, you know, and most notably the company that you're working with. I don't know if Dirk has some other ideas on that because he, he certainly has touched on this. I would love to, to sit in on all those lectures. <laughs> yeah, so, so maybe a very quick answer to both questions. Um, I think responsible innovation is not an open source. It's in the behavior of the innovators. So if you try to encode some notion of responsibility in open source, you'll probably fail because open source by definition should not have restrictions on fields of use, et cetera. 
if you try to do that, you get ethical licenses, which I think by community consensus are not open source licenses. So I would argue it's in the responsibility of the people. To the second question, uh, yeah, I focused on commercial open source where the primary thrust is to make money in a direct way of the open source by a complement. The much more common way uh, of why companies invest in open source is indeed in community open source, but it clearly has a commercial or an economic goal, which is to take away any money out of a particular component that would otherwise be dominated by a monopolist. So we got Linux so that Microsoft didn't dominate the operating system layer with uh, Windows. We got the Eclipse DE so that again, Microsoft didn't dominate uh, the developer tool space. And uh, we got OpenStack as an attempt. Now Kubernetes as at least a partial attempt against AWS and keep them at bay. So it is a very prominent strategy in our industry, in my observation, that as soon as there's one company that is about to dominate as a monopolist or something like it, a particular component or even layer in the stack, uh, the rest of the industry will gang on them and take the money out of that layer by putting community open source against it. And now that we understand with the help of open source foundations and good community governance how to do that, that really is an important potent uh, tool we have for the industry have has really moves things away from traditional sustainable positional advantages into really a continued need for innovation because community open source in my book has the potential of eating up every classic monopolist soft monopolist position from the bottom if you will so um Folks gang up on monopolists, and that's what open source lets us do. I hope my microphone was on and my video yes. was on. And I'm so happy that while uh, that I'm getting a reaction. Thank you. <laughs> really, what do you think? Um, yeah, it's interesting that, you know, the, let's say growing the pie um, uh, dynamic there that also Joshua talked about is, is quite interesting. Um, but there was another question I'm conscious to kind of get them all, uh, get them all in um, by Simon for Dirk on um, if you have information on how often uh, a fork has successfully competed with a well-adopted project. Um, so there's some examples, but uh, I don't know if you are aware of any. I have no, no quantitative data. No quantitative data. All right. Um, let me see. We had, I think, another one from, yes, another one from Simon, uh, which is on, well, I actually attempted monopolization. Thing. I think you answered that one in, in some sense already. I was wondering, in terms of actually sustainability, is maybe um, a question goes to um, maybe specifically Dirk, but in general, in terms of sustainability, are there, the different business models in terms of sustainability. Are there some that you have identified that tend to um, provide a more sustainable way of financing a project? So if you're asking me again, I think community open source like Linux or Kubernetes uh, is sustainable because folks recognize they need it as an important layer in the stack. It's not going away anytime soon. And I really want to pre prevent that anyone else monopolizes that layer in the stack and takes all the money, basically. The commercial open source is really harder because when you look at, say, the single vendor open source, MongoDB that Veronique also mentioned, and uh, I think Elasticsearch was your other example, um, as they mature, they close down. So there's a life cycle to these because at the end, open source as a strategy, go-to-market strategy has run its course. On the one hand, single vendor open source is great because we get open source software funded by venture capitalists, but the long-term perspective is usually that they will try to close it down as a market matures to basically turn as many of the potential users that could be customers into customers. So you either need to fork or do something else and that's always just not so present pleasant. So, um, yeah, so that's it. All right, all right. Um, I think Marco had a question now. I would say there's also an ecosystem building strategy that is relevant in business uh, models. Thank you. 
entirely sure. I'm sure what the question asks, to be honest. Can I can I answer to Marco Berlinger? I would when he says that I would say there is an, also an ecosystem building strategy that is relevant in business models. I, I would say that the, the ecosystem is the is these communities, and really it they must they must be they need to be addressed uh, as a specific uh, uh, let's say target uh, as a specific business model. In fact. It's as if you, as an um, um, open source uh, company, you needed to have uh, business models for your paying customers and a business models to, uh, towards the community. So two, in fact, uh, two-sided business models. 